a free press. Rise joyful from your prison bed of stone. Rise, palsied intellect, the night is past. Cry aloud, feeling that have stifling moaned beneath the weight of many a breaking heart. Come forth, you prisoners, cast off your chains. Come forth, you prisoners, cast off your chains. For lo, the glorious day of triumph dawns, and bring to Hungary that shared your pain. So long, relief, good cheer, and benison. To everybody. Um, thank you, Kirian Esser, for reading the poem A Free Press, written by the Hungarian poet Mihai Voros Marti. Voros Marti Mihai, uh, would the Hungarians say, because they do it the other way around for the Dutch and the English. Um, written in 1848, um, the revolutionary year all over Europe, and especially in Budapest and Hungary, uh, important day. Um, and uh, translated for the Bali, uh, uh, um, uh, we asked translator Bernard, Bernard Adams uh, to translate it specially for this occasion. Um, and thank you, Kirjan Esser, actor. This is the 31st Freedom Lecture, so a warm welcome to you all again. Um, this event is sold out, as you see, and this is what the ministry allows us. <laughs> uh, so um, we're very happy that you're here. And um, you're one of the lucky ones, but there are very many people uh, watching at home on the live stream. It's still a hybrid event, um, so also a warm welcome to the people at home. Um, the Freedom Lecture Series um, is running already for several years. Um, we ask four times a year, we ask somebody to come here and talk about, out, out of personal experience, what it means if you have to fight for some of your freedoms, for some of your constitutional rights, or if they are taken away. And tonight we have it. Uh, we talk about a free press, um, like the poem we were reading out uh, this uh, this evening. Um, we are really, really, really happy and really honored to have Veronica Munk here tonight. Uh, she will share her experiences as a journalist in Hungary in Budapest, former editor of Newsite and Index, and current co-founder of and editor in chief of Telex. Um, furthermore, we will talk uh, with Editor-in-Chief Peter Klok and Assistant Professor of European Human Rights Law uh, at Rijksuniversiteit Groningen, John Morijn. Warm welcome to you both. And we will talk to you later. But first, we're going to listen to uh, Emilie van Oeteren, correspondent in Central Europe for the NRC Handelsblad. Um, please give her a warm applause. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for coming tonight to hear the fabulous Veronica Munk talk about her decade of experience as an independent Hungarian journalist under the regime of Viktor Orban, about her setbacks and her victories for press freedom. She's one of the few people who, in her own words, said fuck no to the practice of mutilating formerly independent media to pro-government propaganda machines. Um, where other journalists may have, like frogs, stayed in sl still in slowly heating water or abandoned journalism altogether, she and her colleagues jumped out of the pot and screamed. Uh, my name is Emily van Outeren, and I frequently visit and write about Hungary and the rest of Central Europe as a correspondent for Dutch Daily NRC. In my job, I have covered and recently experienced how the free press is hindered, targeted, and intimidated and how individual journalists are bullied and threatened by politicians, operatives, and trolls. I hope that a broader view of the region uh, will help you understand that Hungary is not an island of oppression, but rather a model for autocrats to break any resistance they might see preventing them from damaging democracy. But I want to start to have this not be like a, a session of collective depression uh, with two slightly positive notes. Um, and I may have some optimism for you later. So first of all, there is tremendous, in-depth, revelatory, intensely researched invent investigative journalism, especially in Hungary, I think because they have suffered longer than their neighboring countries. Um, fantastic initiatives have arisen. Um, we would not know as much as we do of how Orban enriched his family members and his cronies 
were it not for the investigative work of Hungarian journalists who muckrack through leaked documents and, despite their phones being hacked, managed to cultivate the right sources still. And secondly, the damage to the free press is not irreversible. It could take years to mend a broken constitution, a decade to regain the independence of the judiciary, but those journalists are there, and if given the opportunity, they will be back like this. So what we need to do is to sort of look at how the guardrails for the free press are set, um, and, and in a better way than, than it was done when these countries transitioned to democracy 30 years ago. Guardrails we may even need in countries with, with a much longer journalistic tradition. Maybe even a country where all the serious press are owned by two foreign companies. But we wouldn't be here today if the situation wasn't dire. Very dire. I remember after I moved to Poland in 2019 telling my friends about this weird culture shock that I had. Not about the food or the music, but about the lack of independent, unaffiliated, hold all accountable, hated by everybody with power equally, journalism. Sure, there is no pure censorship. Journalists are not locked up, and unfortunately, with a few exceptions in Slovakia and Malta, are not killed over exposing corruption and doing their work. But they're being thwarted in other ways. And, and, I, and this, this less violent way of hindering journalism and capturing the media, I think, falls into three different modus operandi. There's the financial, the legal, and the lack of access. Um, and they're used simultaneously to create a monopoly on information. And not just to send out raving reviews of, of everything the government does, but to fuel polarization and hate in societies. As a Hungarian media expert I interviewed a couple of years ago said to me, it's not just that aligned oligarchs are used to capture the media and to use them as propaganda, but this monopoly of information of a small corrupt elite can access public money and, uh, um, how do you say this in English, and uh, steer the outcome of elections. Um, and it's not, and it's not just this monopoly, but the fueling, the fueling of hate, and by targeting people as enemies of the nation. So the Orban playbook, which is now de facto copied by uh, by the Polish leader um, Jaroslaw Kaczynski, uh, started, and I'm going to leave most of this to Veronica, but it started with tightening the reins on the the public broadcasting. Um, then came the suspending of advertising revenue to uh, combatant media and giving it to uh, friendly media, subsidizing it in all sorts of ways. Um, and the, the financial strangulation of radio stations, websites, newspapers, meant that they were on the market for, for pennies. Um, we recently in Poland saw um, a state company, an oil company, because Poland doesn't have oligarchs, you do this through state companies, um, buy up um, all, pr pretty much all of the local press, newspapers and weeklies, um, from a German company uh, that doesn't care about free press. They care about making money, and they got a good deal. So within months, all its critical chief editors were replaced, and those who stayed probably owe their continued income to self-censorship. Not everyone with a mortgage and a family can afford to be principled. So, and then there's a new sort of more personal way of um, bleeding the press dry, and that is constantly suing journalists and their publications for defamation and, and alike. And uh, I, I spoke to a press freedom lawyer as recently as Friday, and they told me that the renowned Polish newspaper, Gazeta Wyborcza, has 70 pending cases against it. These, these so-called slap cases or uh, strategic lawsuits are all ultimately won by the free press, despite the capture of the judiciary. But every minute and every penny that is spent on fighting these lawsuits is not spent on real journalism. And that's the point. So I myself recently, upon returning to my apartment in Warsaw, found a 31-page letter 
from a Polish government-affiliated NGO. They demanded a public apology, apology for my reporting in NRC because, in their opinion, I had violated their good name. If I don't delete parts of my article without explaining to my readers why, which is of course something we at NRC would never do, um, they threatened to take me to court. I personally doubt they believe they actually have a legal leg to stand on, but in front of the right judge in Poland, who knows? And even if they don't win, it may serve their objective to pick a fight with a Western European journalist or to intimidate me into thinking twice when I write about them next. Even a person with the privilege I have to leave the country and continue my journalistic work elsewhere, I will admit it spooked me. I feel combatant, but also spooked, spooked enough to have hesitated to tell you about this. That's the chilling effect on me and if they take me to court, other journalists. And then there's the, the aspect of, of access to sources. It's not just that the financial resources dry up, but the information dries up, the transparency. Because it's not just politicians who no longer want to inform independent journalists. People in government, healthcare, education, business, even on the street. They may fear retaliation more than they want to talk to a journalist. So even if you have the resources, information, fact-based journalist uh, journalism is not a given. And neither is independence. Because unfortunately, journalists are also people. And when attacked, they may try to strike back. When portrayed as the enemy, they may act like it. I am very sad to say that the before-mentioned Gazeta Vibocha has basically become a megaphone for the main opposition party. And that does not serve an audience, and that does not serve a democracy. So, as, a, as an independent editor told me, the disastrous consequence is that citizens of these countries are not only poorly informed by the government press, they're poorly informed across the board. They don't no longer know what is happening in their country, and they no longer trust either side or the independent middle. But I promise to leave you with a hint of optimism. Um, the good news is that Hungarian and Polish journalists are not alone. Because unlike Russian, Belarusian, Turkish, Chinese, and many other journalists, they are inside the European Union. And it may not feel to them like they've had much help, not the help they need and deserve. But there have been guardrails to a certain extent. And on top of that, there are people who care, not just other journalists and, and people in academia. There are a few topics I write about that, that make me receive more emails of outrage from readers asking me what they can do. And I tell them how they can donate to initiatives like Veronica's. And I tell them how they can support the free press in their own country. Um, but there is more that all of us can do. Um, and I hope that the discussion today will uh, be a, a little step in that. Thank you very much. And welcome to Veronica. Thank you very much, Emilie van Outeren, um, correspondent for NSA Handelsblad. Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, let's um, continue with Veronica Munk. Um, warm welcome to you and um, the 31st um, lecture, Freedom Lecture here at the Bali. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you for being here and coming here. on the screen, please. Thank you so much. Is it all right? Can you hear me? Perfect. Good evening. Good evening for everyone. And thank you very much that all of you came to, to hear 
uh, my speech tonight. Um, this evening I will talk about the situation of the freedom of press in Hungary. And also I will talk my second most favorite topic after my kids and family, uh, telex. Uh, and I'd like to talk about the future of independent media and how I see it from, from, uh, from Hungary. Uh, freedom can mean a lot of things to different people. For me, it means that I stick to the values that are most important to me. And uh, in my prof profession, which is journalism, those values are quite crystal clear. You need to be transparent, you need to be fair, you need to be curious, you need to be transparent, and uh, of course, as much possible, you need to be objective. So when I have to make hard decisions in my professional life and my professional freedom, I always look for these crystal clear boundaries. And sometimes it involves tears. On this photo, which toured the Hungarian media and appeared in some major international newspapers, I cry bitterly while my colleagues who support me also cry regardless of their gender. In the photo, I am mourning the nearly 20 years I spent in the job, initially as an intern, then as a reporter, then as a deputy editor-in-chief at Index, the, the largest, the then largest Hungarian news site that I loved passionately. And I mourned the situation that I had to put my resignation on the table a couple of minutes ago. And more than 80 of us did the same, editors, reporters, video journalists, photographers, financial officers, everybody left, everybody quit Index. We quit the day after our editor-in-chief, Sabolj Dul, was fired. We quit because we knew that our independent journalistic operation was no longer possible. But sometimes, and that is the good news, tears can turn into white smiling in a very short period of time. This other photo was taken only nine weeks after the previous one. This picture also made its rounds in the Hungarian media and appeared in quite a few international outlets as well, even on Wikipedia. Uh, in these pictures, I am extremely exhausted, but at the same time, extremely happy as I'm pressing a red button symbolize, symbolizing uh, the launching of Telex which is now, a year later, the largest crowdfunding-based news portal in Hungary and has received a dozen different journalistic awards and has around six to 700,000 readers per day and more than 47,000 donors. But let's go back a little bit uh, in time, and let me explain what index meant for the Hungarian public sphere. It was the largest 20-year-old uh, market-leading, most read news site in the country. When we worked there, index had around 1 to 1.5 million readers per day and covered every story that mattered. We produced news, videos, podcasts, investigative pieces, and if someone, regardless of his or her political views, wanted to know what happened, what's happening in the country or outside the, con the country in the world, they just clicked on index and got unbiased news. So it is understandable that our mass resignation had a large impact. On this video, you can see but we are walking on the corridors of index to hand in our resignations.
We quit because we no longer saw any safeguards ensuring that we would get to work freely and independently. We resigned because independent journalism was no longer guaranteed due to the increasing influence of government-linked businessmen in Index's leadership and ownership. Years before the editor-in-chief was fired, Index's editorial staff drew the line and set two simple conditions regarding what in, uh, independent operation means for us. Namely, that nobody from the outside the newsroom can tell us what to write and how, or with whom we should or shouldn't be working. Up to the start of the conflict, these conditions were met. But then, based on an outside initiative from external advisors, Index's boards of directors had taken a step towards the complete overhaul of the structure of the new site's editorial staff. And then editor-in-chief Sabolj Dool had resisted the plan and published an article explaining that he feels and the whole newsroom feel that Index's independence is in danger. After that, he was fired and all of us decided to quit. Never before had the dismissal and the mass resignation attracted so much public attention in Hungary. After the mass departure, several thousands of people demonstrated on the streets of Budapest for press freedom and mourned the loss of the medium that until then had credibly, quickly and accurately met their information needs around the clock. They were marching with billboards like free country, free press, and 70 brave people. It was moving. So, and, and I really have not foreseen this, but it became obvious that we needed to fill the void that, that these people who were marching on the street, that, that they are missing, that they, we were keen to give them something to read. And in, in a blink of an eye, we became the news ourselves. Journalists became the news ourselves. The fact that Hungary's most popular media outlet was going under for political reasons was seized upon by the WordPress, from the Washington Post to the Japanese public television through BBC and the Volksgrant. Uh, as an independent journalist who has worked in Hungary for decades, who has a media studies PhD, and who experienced the politically influenced takeover, I can assure you that freedom of press is in a very bad shape in my country. Uh, considering the World Press Freedom Index, uh, developed by Reporters Without Borders, evaluating media freedom across the globe on an annual basis, Hungary, after 15 years of continuous decline, now ranks 92nd. In 2006, it was 10th place on the list of 168 countries. The only EU country ranking lower is Bulgaria, while countries such as Albania, Moldova, uh, and North Macedonia are ahead of Hungary. For those who are not very closely familiar with the Hungarian media sphere, I'd like to give a brief summary of the current situation. There are five important factors that shaped Hungar the Hungarian media in the last decade. The first, the primary, the first is, is basically this pro-urban, pro-governmental media conglom conglomerate which took over the majority of the media landscape. Uh, the primary reason behind this downward trend that you saw in the freedom of press data in the situation and the, in the situation of, of freedom of press is the transformation of the Hungarian media market and its structure over the past decade, during which more and more independent media outlets fell into hands of business circles with close ties to the political elite. It's worth stressing that these businesses did not act independently, but as ex executors of an overreaching Fidesz strategy. Their transactions were, at the end of the day, financed by taxpayer money. Over the last 10 years, 
even ever more printed media, radio and TV stations were acquired by people with connections to politics and politicians. The Hungarian media landscape basically fractured in these two distinct, distinct parts, outlets linked to the governing party and ones independent of it. Uh, the second uh, uh, important factor is that the Hungarian public broadcasting is basically a megaphone of the government. The public broadcasting companies funded this year by Hungarian taxpayers to the tune of about 339 million euros are basically a mouthpiece for the government. And there is this very special thing in Hungary, which do not have in any other countries, uh, that several hundred private media outlets, private media outlets, are concentrated in the centrally managed Central European Press and Media Foundation called Keshma. It's an institution with a pronounced government bias. Keshma, which is classified as a matter of national strategic interest by the government, was established three years ago, and uh, its, portfolio, its portfolio includes TV channels, tabloids, uh, radio stations, online news sites, and all, basically all county dailies, around 500 media outlets. There has been no such media holding in, in Hungary since the communist era. And the level of media concentration and this model at all, that the foundation will have around 500 media products which are operated centrally, is unprecedented in Europe. The scale of media concentration is unthinkable, I think, in the Western world. Uh, and this Keshma is a non-profit organization established uh, by Orban Loyalist and runs this immerse media portfolio received from several pro-government businessmen as charitable donations. So it is important to highlight that why all the assets of these 500 outlets uh, were donated to the foundation by their share shareholders, the corresponding transactions amount to about 90 million euros, according to estimates. And uh, here you can see an example of the centralization, how county dailies was published when the prime minister gave his Christmas interview two years ago. So the fourth factor is what Emily was talking a little bit about, uh, the advertisement market. The Hungarian advertisement market is also an area heavily influenced by politics. One of the biggest players placing advertisement, advertisements in the media is the Hungarian state itself. And it is important because traditionally and normally media outlets are financed by advertisement. But uh, if, uh, if those who are deemed sympathetic to the administration are allocated advertisement, while those classified as hostile are excluded, so, uh, so it's a result that they can barely keep their heads above the voter financially, or they need to be creative and find another possibilities to, to finance themself, themselves. Uh, and the fifth factor is access to information. Journalists do not go to prison in Hungary, and there have been no murders of journalists in the recent memory. Yet the work of independent journalists has rarely been more difficult. Not only do we have to struggle to maintain an, ec an economic basis of our work, but we also have to fight for access to information running up against brick walls when making inquiries in the public interest or requesting interviews is a constant, not getting answers is par for the course. I tell you one example. Of the 100 days of uh, Telex's existence, we recorded and documented, documented on what subject we, we, what subject we asked uh, a question to any Hungarian ministries and whether there was an answer or not. If it 
if it came, if there was an answer, we of course, we published the answer in the article. If we didn't, we could only indicate in the name of transparency that we w there was a question and there is no answer. And uh, during these first 100 days of Telex, we sent out 52 different inquiries to different Hungarian ministries and we received, we received responses in only nine cases. So not only is the Hungarian press currently experiencing, experiencing painful cutbacks, but the ability of people in Hungary to access information is also being increasingly impaired. The shrinking media space is limiting the freedom of all of us and weakening democracy. That is why we, together with my colleagues, decided last summer that we would dare to think big and we launch a large, independent, free news portal. That is how Telex was born. Telex is serving general interest and respecting such principles as relevance, fairness, credibility, entertainment, speed, and then not least, accuracy. Uh, Telex la was launched on the 2nd of October last year, operates 24 seven with a 70 strong newsroom, publishing around 80 articles and videos on weekdays and approximately 60 on Saturdays and Sundays. And we have around, as I mentioned, six to 700 readers a day. And as a media platform, Telex not un only covers public affairs, but offers a diverse range of content from news and videos about the economy, culture, sports, the latest technological development, scientific breakthroughs, to exciting, entertaining, unbiased, northworthy stories about events in Hungary and around the globe. Our business model based on crowdfunding, and we are transparent on how we spend the money, publishing transparency reports every six months. And we pride, proud, pride ourselves on producing journalism that is both neutral and independent. So founded in the media environment, currently pre prevalent in Hungary, and what's more, during a pandemic, Telex's success is unprecedented and unique feat. No one has established such a large editorial office before by means of crowdfunding alone. In the space of one month, we collected one million euros from our readers. Today in Hungary, a country of 10 million people, so far 74,000 people have contributed with smaller or larger occasional or regular sums to keep Telex running. And why do they support us? Uh, according to our readers' survey, 93% of our donors agreed with the statement that I, financi I financially support Telex because I consider the strengths of the Telex team and the cause of independent press important. They donate Telex because they would like to consume fact-based quality journalism and because our team said no in a country where usually people don't say no to power. Telex's unique story is receiving a great deal of international attention. Countless newspapers, television and radio stations have reached out to us over the past year to inquire about our story or even Hungary's media situation. And our story and work has been worldwide, report, re, worldwide reported by the largest news media and has even been recognized with prestigious awards in 2020 and 2021. So regarding the future, the future of news media looks to many and for a variety of reasons to be largely funded by money from readers. In Hungary, for sure, if more and more people realize that the existence of independent media depends on them, it will last longer. I think our mass resignation was the point where they 
decided that they need to contribute financially, not just at the newsstands on the street, but online as well. I strongly believe in readers' revenue, and that this is the future. But I also see there are no static situations in, hung in, in, in Hungary and its public sphere. The government has recently proposed mandatory listing of, of the names of wealthy donors who support NGOs. This proposal, luckily, was never implemented in the end, but it is clear that if something like this happens in Hungary, it can generally and greatly reduce the willingness to donate. And also, as an international investigation has found this summer that Pegasus, the spyware manufactured by Israeli cybersecurity firm NSO Group, has been in use in Hungary for years against targets such as investigative journalists and media owners, as well as against people around their personal circles. This fact can also harm access to information and willingness of sources to talk freely to journalists. By the way, the whole Pegasus story was broke on Telex by Direct 36 investigative uh, journalist, journalism team. It is increasingly, increasingly hard to be true to the original values of quality news journalism, but we will do just that. All of us here, you can see us on the picture. In the face of propaganda and adversity, we must remind ourselves every day that our enemy is not the government and our job is not to change people's minds. Our job is to select and produce the most relevant news each day, to work on stories, and if we must, hopefully not a boring manner. We do what we do so Hungarian people can make up their own minds about the important stuff. And it is an honor that so many of them made up their minds regarding telex and fi find us worthy of their support. I think telex's, telex's strengths relies on the whole team, on our transparency, our impartiality, and our fairness. And uh, it might be a cliche to end my speech with the sentence that one year ago, me and my colleagues wouldn't have thought, but the truth is, we wouldn't have thought. <laughs> but there was one important thing that we were sure of. The only mistake we could have made was if we didn't even try. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you very much. If you want to come, you, if you please take a seat. Thank you very much for your lecture. Um, before we um, dive deeper into a conversation about um, freedom of press in Hungary and Europe and the legalities about it, I would like you to listen first again to Kirian Esser um, reading a second po poem you have chosen for us tonight. The poem is um, called your Two Arms, written by Miklos Ratnoti in 1941. Ratnoti Miklos, would that be in Hungarian? Yeah. <laughs> Kirian Esser. In Your Two Arms. In your two arms, I am rocking quietly. In my two arms, you are rocking quietly. In your two arms, I'm a child, reticent. In my two arms, you're a child, I'm listening. With your two arms, you embrace me when I'm afraid. With my two arms, I embrace you, and I'm not afraid. In your two arms, even death's great silence cannot frighten me. In your two arms, I fall through death as through a dream, soundlessly. Um. You chose those two, we asked you to, but you chose those two um, uh, poems. Um, just briefly, maybe, but uh, why those two? Well, one is about freedom of press, the mm -hmm. first one, 
Uh, and the second was just a personal choice. It's about love, which is an important value to me as well. And I love this poem, so that's behind the choice. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Freedom of press um, from 1848, from the revolution in yes. Budapest in that time. Do you think there's a slight um, uh, uh, a familiarity with 1848 and the situation now, or is there anything? Mm. It's, it's re tends to repeat itself, but not in the same way. Uh, is it to be to be learned lessons learned from 1848? Well, uh, I I do not think that there is a parallel situation. I mean, uh, it is the situation is really hard, but we could create telex. The mm -hmm. media pluralism is in a great danger, the media pluralism is in a very bad shape, but still we could create a media company, we could start a new outlet, uh, and, and that could have been possible in the communist era or, or, or in, in the 1848 back then when the poem was written. written. Yeah. So yeah, I'm a little bit optimistic. Good, good. Um, two other questions maybe about your lecture and then we're going to ask the other two speakers to join in uh, here. But um, you, you, you showed a little film, little newsreel of um, um, the people uh, handing in their, res their resignation and um, you are the mother of two children. Um, I'm just wondering on a very personal level, weren't you sort of well, maybe afraid to you know, give up your job. It's not, I mean, there are not that many other media outlets in Hungary who, so I mean, that's sort of about it. Yeah, it, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't an easy choice. It was basically the hardest decision of my life, but in the same time, the easiest, because you know, those boundaries that I was talking about, that those values that are important to me, it just, I just thought that it's just not possible to continue. I have to quit. And I thought, OK, maybe we jump into the novel. And everybody did the same, you know, not just myself alone with families and, and different kind of life mm -hmm. situation. 90 of us was in the same uh, situation. And those were basically individual choices. Uh, and of course, I was sad and I was afraid. But I thought that there is no other option just to quit. But like you said in your lecture, you know, uh, it would be cliche to think who would have thought, but who would have thought, you know? With, yeah. In other words, you would never have thought that you would no. continue. So that was just basically giving up your income yes. with, a, with a, a young family. Yes, yeah, that's true, that's true. And uh, until we, we started the crowdfunding campaign in mm -hmm. the beginning of September last year, uh, and until that day, we didn't know. I had to turn to my colleagues and say, please come and work with me. It's gonna be very good, you know, that we can work together. I don't have money. <laughs> Just please come. Yeah. Basically, that was the message. And everybody came. Uh, and, and, the, and on the day the crowdfunding started, basically in a couple of hours, it became obvious that we did it. But uh, as, as I've, shown, I've shown the pictures about the protest, so we felt that if there are so many people who, who believe in us, mm -hmm. uh, then, then, then there might be a chance. But we didn't know that they will, they will open their pockets, you know? It's not the same that you go to the street and, and say something passionately and it's another thing to pay. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, yeah. But uh, it, it turned out great. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I want you to go back a little bit further. This is the moment in which you realize, oh, it's working and it's going to turn out good or at least interesting. <laughs> and, and But before that, um, because freedom of press is a very theoretical thing to most of us you know it's something which we either take for granted or think about it as a lofty thing which you know ought to be there like you know the constitution ought to be there and it's very theoretical to most people when you breathe the air of freedom but i'm wondering the moment what can you remember the moment when you thought i am going to hand in my re mm -hmm. resignation what was what was the threshold what 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 thing sort of 
mm. happened there. Mm -hmm. Because going from theory to a practical thing where you give up your livelihood yeah. is a different thing, of course. The practical moment when I, when I heard that they fired Sabolj Dula, our editor-in-chief. Mm -hmm. But How did you hear that? Hmm? How did you hear that? I was at home mm -hmm. because I was out of office with mm -hmm. my kids. Mm -hmm. We wanted to spend a nice day together. Mm -hmm. And then I got a call. And then I told to my kids that, OK, guys, we don't go to the playground because I need to go to the office to, to quit. But of course, <laughs> before, <laughs> 10 years ago or, or five years ago, it, it was obvious, it, it was a long and, and, uh, and slow process. Okay. So mm -hmm. I, I started the morning basically years before. Mm -hmm. It was obvious for me years before and then Mars months before that it's gonna end as soon as those businessmen who had strong connections to the, gov to the government, to politicians, and who had, uh, and, and who, was, who was part of the public media before the gentleman called Miklos Vasily. And when he came around the company uh, in the spring, I, j I just thought that it's gonna happen, but, the moment, but until we could create uh, independent newspaper, with our team because the newsroom was independent and and when and the moment they fired the editor in chief okay it was it was obvious I, 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 w I was crying of course but I I was in a calm manner because it wasn't it was shocking but it it it, it, it was expected mm -hmm. so you were crying in a calm manner yeah yeah. I can do that no, no, I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm just I'm just uh, trying to imagine what it would be to give up um, your livelihood, you know, in a moment, at the, in a decision. But you're saying it was not the spur of a moment. It was something that was building up for years. Yes. Yeah. 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 It wasn't like this historical. That's how the propaganda media uh, addressed this whole situation. That it was a historical moment, and those journalists were were pressuring each other to quit. There was no pressure on each mm -hmm. other, and and everybody just. Oh, told that, okay, when we asked to put back the editor-in-chief to its position and they, they said, no, it's not possible, and there was no answers why, and there was no, there was totally intransparent what's going on uh, in, in the ownership structure of the company, and, and then we just said goodbye. Yeah. And remarkable, because um, it's nice to have principles, it's difficult to uh, live by them if you have a small family. Um, Thank you for now. I'd like to um, go to uh, two of our other guests and invite them here to one of the two chairs. Um, uh, welcome to Peter Klok, Editor-in-Chief of the Volkskrant, um, and uh, John Morijn, Assistant Professor of European Human Rights Law at the Rijksuniversiteit Groningen. Warm welcome to you both. Um, um, maybe to... Um, to uh, yeah, it's, that's... The, the right way to do it. I did the, the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, maybe maybe to start off, um, because um, Hungary is of course a, uh, a member of the European Union, and it's, you know we have this 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 experiment which we call um, uh, the European Union. It's a political unity. Um, there's a European space in which we can move and uh, um, uh, work across borders and those sort of things. Um, Maybe, maybe to start um, uh, um, with you, John. Um, from a legal point of view, um, in your opinion, what's happening there in, in Hungary? If you if you look at it, and you know, um, would that would that be um, all in order, or would that be um, um, uh, would there be remarkable uh, uh, things to say about it? Uh, it would definitely, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me and great speech, uh, Veronica. Uh, thank you, yeah. Uh, so, yes, sure, I'll sit. Uh, so this is a case study on how to uh, uh, do violations uh, uh, of, of, humor, uh, of, of EU law for about uh, 10 years in a row uh, without being confronted by that. Uh, so it's absolutely clear that what's happened here uh, in, in, in Hungary, and particularly also in the press, is a violation of European Union law because 
you can only be a member of the European Union uh, when you uh, comply with uh, basic values like human rights protection, uh, like, uh, uh, like the rule of law. Um, uh, and, and it's also clear that you can only remain a member of the European Union if you continue to comply uh, with these. Uh, so uh, what we have seen, uh, there's no unclarity about uh, whether there was a violation. There's an there's a unclarity uh, on, on why it took so long to start enforcing these very clear uh, rules. And so what, 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 what is the violation about? Because you can buy newspapers, and you know, what, what I just heard from, from you is a very effective maybe campaign to, sure. to, to but illegal? Now, in legal terms, uh, um, the violation here uh, um, is, is two things. And one, the European Commission recently actually did act on, and the other, it has not yet acted on. The, f the, the, the violation here is that um, uh, in the way that uh, Orban, as described by Veronica, uh, is trying to affect uh, uh, full control of the media is an infringement of the internal market of the European Union. Because if you and me would start... Uh, uh, a radio station uh, in the Netherlands, and we would also want to uh, broadcast, for example, in Hungary, mm -hmm. it would also be affected by the, the draconian laws that uh, Veronica just uh, uh, described. So it's a violation of competition law. It's a violation of the freedom to provide services, and that's mm -hmm. recently also wh why the European Commission brought, uh, threatened to bring Hungary to court over some of the things that happened in uh, f uh, freedom, or, uh, freedom of the, the, the press in Hungary. There's also one element uh, that it has not yet done, uh, the European Commission, but where you can also see a clear violation of, of uh, EU law, and that's the following. You need uh, uh, for, for a European Parliament elections to be free and fair. Mm -hmm. Voters in Hungary need to uh, be able to inform themselves from various different independent sources. And that is now uh, dramatically under pressure. So recently I, I wrote a, an article together with the Polish Ombudsman saying that the European uh, Union could also uh, act uh, and, and bring a case against Hungary and also Poland for saying that if you put such pressure on freedom of the press, you're also make it, it, uh, making it impossible to have free and fair elections for European Parliament elections and local elections, which are both fully covered by EU law. So you see now one part that the EU has actually started to act to protect uh, the freedom of the press. And there's also a lot of uh, routes that uh, are clear violations, but uh, that are not yet acted upon by, by the EU. Why not? What? Um, it's maybe a political question, not no, a legal it's not, question. It's, it's actually a very good question. I'm very glad to have this uh, conversation today because I think it shows, just by listening to Veronica and also to Emily earlier, uh, how urgent this uh, question is. And uh, it sounds totally bizarre to the people who, who come here uh, maybe tonight. But I've been working on this for 10 years, both as a diplomat and as an academic. And everywhere I go and talk about this, people don't understand really the urgency and, and don't uh, understand that there's really a, a, a conscience agenda behind uh, trying to suppress uh, freedom of the press. Uh, and, and that recognition that this is really urgent and there's really, a uh, there's really an agenda behind trying to suppress your opponents in, mm -hmm. in that way, hasn't really trickled up until extremely recently in the European Union setting, which sounds totally bizarre, but that's really the only reason why only very recently the European Union has started to act. There was simply no awareness that there was really uh, this, this agenda and this urgency behind it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would, that's, that's remarkable, of course, if you, if you look at the amount of um, um, uh, media outlets which have been sort of uh, dwindling away or, or, or being bought. Or, are you surprised that it, that it didn't sort of reach the minds of, of, of those who are making those decisions? Well, I get, it, I get it used to it. Actually, I saw m many talks, a lot of talks about Hungarian freedom of press in the EU from very high level uh, um, politicians and not that much act. You mm -hmm. mentioned competition law. For instance, Cashma is a very good example yeah, the of harming the, the, the non-profit the organization 500 which, media which, outlets uh, you described which yeah. you concentrate it's a conglomerate with 500 outlets so basically that's uh, that's par excellence <laughs> harming of of competition law uh, and EU had had a look and decided they cannot do anything so basically uh, I'm an impartial journalist so I don't like to say to politicians what to do or what not to do so I I, I would not 
recommend anything to EU officials, but I can share the information that we could not see very uh, serious acts regarding this whole situation. We could see some grants, some EU grants uh, on spending, the on, on not just on Hungarian, but freedom of press uh, in countries, but in the end of the day, it's politicians financing media, which is not independency. So, yeah, the situation is all about talking so far. Peter Klok, um, if you hear this, um, this lecture, and um, more especially the lack of awareness in Western Europe or in the Union at large, are you surprised by that, or are you, and maybe also because um, you are a journalist uh, with long-standing uh, uh, decades of experience, you know, how come that those things don't trickle down in the right places? I think because it's very difficult to, to imagine that such a thing is possible in Europe. Yeah, that's maybe, yeah. You, you have to <laughs> hear it from, from the first mouth. Yeah. Because normally you should say this is not possible. How, how, how is it possible? We were going forward with Europe. Everything was going forward and uh, we're not uh, prepared for um, countries Nosedive. getting rid of democracy. The uh -huh. European Union is not, not based on it. And for us, it's unimaginable that you want to get rid of democracy. So I think it's a lack of uh, fantasy. Uh, we, we, we don't feel it that strong, as, as Veronica put it into words. Yeah. So it's also a problem at, at the citizens. I, I don't see a, a big movement in Holland uh, of people worrying about it. And, and uh, no. I think that's a problem. I think mm -hmm. we should... Uh, uh, yeah, we had a correspondent, Jenny Jan Holtland, who, who was very uh, uh, full active. of this matter, yeah. very active on this matter. But, but it's, it's difficult to get all the readers uh, in the same um, mood. Uh, so we're trying our best, and uh, but but we have a long way to go. We we should uh, write more about it, I think, and stronger and 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 sharper. Maybe, maybe, maybe also, yeah, yeah, maybe. But, but when Veronica put everything on a road, that's really one co one uh, company with four, five hundred, five almost five hundred outlets. That that that's enormous. Yeah, that's bigger than we've ever seen in Europe or elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, I didn't realize that it was already so, so enormous and, and so big. Yeah. Because he, he, he did it in small steps, of course. So, so it's... No, but you're absolutely right. I mean, we have good correspondents there. Uh, uh, one talk tonight and one... Uh, yeah, Jan also Holtland strong who, language. Uh, and and um, uh, it's not that they're not aware of the situation. So it's... People who experience uh, it are completely aware of the situation. But you have to experience it, I, I think. And, and you're doing your best also by bringing people to Holland to tell their story. But to feel it, it it's another thing to, uh, than to read it. And, and I think a lot of people don't, don't, don't feel it yet, no. what's happening there. No. And it's quite frightening, it's quite depressing. It's also quite hopeful that there's still a lot of mostly people... Mostly depressing. Like, <laughs> mostly depressing. <laughs> but uh, f yeah, there are still 47,000 Hungarians who, yeah. uh, um, who want to support you. But it's 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 a completely uh, uh, yeah, unimaginable in a way, and 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 so depressing that that, that it's almost impossible to 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 believe it. I, I'm reading the the second part of the Scurati biography of Mussolini at mm -hmm. the moment. And Just came out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And, and uh, that's a complete other situation. But but if you uh, uh, democracy needs a, a lot of love and care, and 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 also uh, you have to realize that that, that you can lose it. Mm -hmm. And that feeling is, isn't in Holland. I think well, democracy is there forever. It's, it's, it's forever to stay here. And we should realize that it's vulnerable actually, and that you should take care of it and that you should help countries who are struggling to, to uh, keep it. The Scurati um, uh, novels actually of the life of Mussolini. Uh, the, the yeah, it's not a biography. It's, 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 it's well, a it's a biography, but yeah, it's a wonderful book. Fiction is a biography, <laughs> yeah. Um, um, we come back to this love, care and tender um, uh, about democracy and what we could do about it. But um, um, one thing I was wondering what, because you're saying there they're just the union is just starting to sort of implement a few of those possible possible ways to act and protect press freedom. Um, uh, what could they do? 
I mean, what is there? I mean, you say that there's other things. What, what, what? Actually, what possibilities are there? Because on the other hand, Hungary, Hungary is also, you know, a sovereign nation. Mm. I mean, you can't do anything. Not, not, not everything, I would think. Well, now, uh, uh, in fact, uh, this is an interesting moment in time because I think the last couple of weeks we've seen a real sea change happening in in, uh, in Brussels, not directly with regard to Hungary, but actually with regard to Poland, because it's the very first time just the other day. Are, are those cases? sort of similar? Yeah, they're similar, and they're also similar in the mind of uh, Hungarian politicians, because uh, there was uh, the, the Minister of Justice of, uh, of Hungary uh, just uh, two days ago uh, published a, a sort of a report uh, saying that they are on the side of Poland, so they also feel um, uh, sort of connected. So what happened to Poland? The European, uh, uh, the European Court of Justice said that in Poland the problem with judicial independence and, 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 and uh, taking away immunity from judges simply for reason of the content of their judgment was a violation of European Union law. And so they won the case in uh, in Luxembourg. Mm -hmm. uh, At the court then, in Luxembourg, yep. yeah. Yeah, uh, and uh, the European Court of Justice yep. in, in Luxembourg. And what did they do in Poland? Nothing. So there's then another procedure under European Union law that you can take a country back uh, to the European Court of, uh, of Justice and asking for a penalty payment. This is, that's extremely rare, it, uh, and, and it actually happened for the first time uh, last week. Uh, and, and Hungary uh, realized that uh, we are also losing all our cases uh, in, uh, in, in Luxembourg, and we don't implement them. Mm -hmm. One of the, the, the recent cases that Veronica actually mentioned was, for example, that uh, if you want to run an NGO in, uh, in Hungary, uh, you need to list on your website uh, who are your donors, which has a chilling effect, uh, precisely. Uh, yeah, but it's never... It hasn't happened. been implemented, uh, but uh, the European Court of Justice actually said that uh, such chilling effect is in itself a violation of European Union law. So you really see that uh, it has sort of trickled up, this sense of urgency that I uh, started... Uh, trickling up is a nice way of putting yeah. it, yeah. <laughs> and, and, I, and I do think that's a real uh, change of the uh, of direction of the oil tanker. Uh, and it's quite interesting to, to, to see that uh, uh, Judith Varga, or I should say Varga Judith, uh, probably uh, to you, which is the Minister of, who is the Minister of Justice, uh, published a letter saying that uh, uh, they would be on the side of Poland, uh, uh, in this case, about the penalty payment um, for judicial independence. And actually, they were making precisely the same argument that you just uh, put to me, um, you know, isn't this a violation of our national sovereignty and all that? Well, uh, that's the world on its head, because it was a decision of national sovereignty to become a, a member of the European Union in the first place. And mm -hmm. then you also sign up to all the, the basic rules to be a part of that. The acquis communautaire to use acquis, it. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and fundamental rights protection and, and, and the rule of law are simply part and parcel of that. What you often hear as well, uh, said by, by Hungarian politicians that, you know, we signed up to it, but we didn't really know what it meant, because it's unclear what the rule of law is. Uh, that's also, uh, 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 to put it sharply, BS, uh, uh, because it's simply written down black and white in, in uh, uh, legislation that is currently in force. And that le legislation is about that you can only get EU funding if you comply with the rule of law. No, no rule of law, no cash. And that's currently the hot potato in, in Brussels, because for the first time, and the European Union is actually holding up cash uh, to uh, both Poland and, and Hungary. And that's where you really uh, have these, uh, these governments cornered. Because uh, one of the things that, that Veronica hasn't really mentioned, but that is uh, an important aspect of thinking about the problem in, in Hungary, Orban controls uh, uh, the, the media at home, but he also controls part of the uh, messaging in the European uh, Union br uh, bubble. Uh, and uh, uh, his world sort of collapses uh, uh, in, in the, of, of being con in control of this if the European Union said, well, your problem at home is actually so big that you don't get cash. That's really putting him in a tough spot. And we're talking about billions and billions uh, of euros. Uh, so uh, also there you see a real sea change. And I do believe that uh, perhaps if we would have had this conversation uh, two weeks from now into the future, we would already have a, sort of a more hopeful uh, conversation. I'm, I'm not only at all uh, pessimistic, I see some real changes uh, going on, but the problem is simply all the damage that has already been done and, and all the, the misery that we've seen in, uh, in the lecture described by, by Veronica. 
I, I, I do believe that it will first get worse before it can get better. Uh, in the same letter that uh, I just mentioned from Judith Farga, she implied as a, as a threat that uh, if the European Union would continue to be so tough on Poland and therefore by definition also on Hungary, that the European Union should be aware that both Hungary and Poland are the external borders of the European Union, basically implicitly saying that if you uh, make our life uh, too uh, difficult, uh, we'll be the next Belarus and we open our borders and all the, the migrants uh, can come in. So there's a lot of... The same thing Erdogan did. Yeah, exactly. Thing to, so yeah. Uh, I, I, I do believe that, uh, you know, there are still member states, and, and, and rightly so, Hungary and Poland, so they have the right to vote in, on every file. So we can uh, bang the drum on the rule of law, and I'm glad that we do that in the Netherlands. We are a big proponent. But if the next day there's a fisheries council, uh, Hungary and Poland uh, uh, may want to vote in, in the way that is not that beneficial to, to the Netherlands. So it's, 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 an, it's very difficult to isolate the rule of law only. It's a much bigger uh, 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 political problem that we have, uh, let's say, two uh, actors that are rogue actors and that do not comply with judgments of the, the, the Luxembourg court. And only now, uh, when we are really putting them under pressure, it's very unpredictable how they're going to react, and they still have the right to vote. So it's, 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 uh, it, it may first get worse before it can get better. Um, Judith Varga was a guest here in the Bali, not yeah. so, um, just before the pandemic, actually. Um, very impressive speaker. Um, and in a way, you could say, um, I mean, it's clear what you're saying. I mean, the rule of law is just written down, and it's crystal clear. It's, you know, there's nothing. Um, but on the other hand, um, and maybe more on the political side, you know, um, those are countries who are, have been under um, a Soviet rule for a very long time, of course, uh, for decades. And um, I could imagine that from the political point of view, and I'm putting this question also maybe to you because you're Hungarian, you live there, you know, it would be for many Hungarians very... Um, um, no, no, very difficult to stomach that, you know, um, uh, um, sort of a, uh, a rule of law or, or, or the, the implications of that are, are laid down by a place, first they were laid down from Moscow, now they're laid down from Brussels. You know, how do you listen to this conversation about the union being able to, to um, uh, coerce or uh, to, to withhold pay payments to Hungary? And, you know, from a political point of view, how, how, would, how do you listen to that? Uh, actually, Hungarians are really uh, believe in the EU. So according to the polls, Hungarians do not want to leave the EU. No. Uh, so there is uh, the governmental narrative that the EU is basically uh, the enemy, the worst thing that ever happens. That's the, in, the, the inside narratives in the country. And then there is this other narrative uh, in Brussels with the officials, which is a totally other narrative that the Hungarian government uh, um, spreading. So I do not think uh, that uh, uh, Hungarians would react that, that okay, then leave the EU, because, because they just really, they not believe in the, they, they are, I think, the most important factor is the money, of course, and a lot of projects and a lot of developments uh, in my country rise on uh, EU budget. Uh, and uh, it never happened that the money was cut. Uh, but still, there was no, the, all of the money, I mean, now there is this conversation, then it, then this is the first time that it's a possibility that they cut the sauce. Uh, but uh, they, I think, I hope the Hungarians will understand that this is the reaction of harming the democracy. We will see. It's not really obvious that what's uh, going to happen. Um, and it's not really obvious that they will cut the money. No, no. Both are still uh, in the future. Um, would, you, would you be, um, would you think, Peter Klok, um, that it would be about time to sort of act on those principles which have been laid down by the Union? You know, how, how would you think, how would that go down in Holland? Uh, no, I think it will go down very well. Uh, Mark Rutte was quite outspoken the last time about Hungary, so it's, I think, uh, start. <laughs> Dutch people are starting to see that, that it's going too far and that we should act. So I think that there's support of the, of the uh, uh, Dutch population if he does something like that, 
But the, the, the European Union is a community of very small steps, and that's very yeah. frustrating. But it's also a value to always take very small steps, and, and, and as long as they're going in the right direction, and uh, if I believe, John, they are, then perhaps that's the way, be because if you take two, two drastic steps that can also have s repercussions and sure. uh, yeah. two things that you they can They can vote want. about our fishing rights and so on and so on. Ah, yeah, <laughs> that's not the biggest <laughs> problem, but, but is there if, no. if there's even more political instability in Hungary uh, or more support for Orban, that's because he can play the victim, that, that's also not a good thing. So I think that there's... Um, it, it, most of the time it's good for the EU to take small steps, but, but they should take them and perhaps accelerate a little bit. And yeah, and I, I don't understand, but perhaps you can um, elaborate on that, why it's so difficult to just say no money this year, because there's no free press in your country. That's, that's mm -hmm. one of the most basic things of democracy. So. Sometimes you, 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 there's not an iron will in, in the EU or something, or, or someone who says it's just enough. Uh, and sometimes you, you want to see a politician like that who just says, it, and now it's enough. Cut the crap, we're just going to act. Yeah, well, um, we have a lot of problems here in Holland which are not you know, handled in that, yeah. <laughs> in that same way. But so. I, don't know, I, I don't know the psychology of Orban, but, but I, I can imagine that it works if you just... That he needs Be firm. Yeah. Be firm and strong, no. No. and you can do it the, the, the legal way, and, and I, I don't know, if in the end he's not interested in, 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 in the rule of law, I think, so. And if you, if, um, you listen to this story of, you know, um, um, uh, crowdfunding a, a, a basic um, a news outlet, Huh? Yeah. Um, uh, it, it, uh, I, I agree with you, it's not only, uh, um, it's also uh, uh, inspiring, isn't yeah. it? So, uh, as a newspaper man, I... I wonder, because uh, you're part of a, a rather big conglomerate in Holland, of course, of uh, newspapers yeah. and Holland and Belgium. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm saying you, but you're the chief editor, of course, and you're not on the business side, you're a journalist. But um, if I listen to this, I wonder, you know, um, I just begin to think, you know, we could cooperate more in Europe in, you know, sharing costs or, 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 or correspondence or... Um, and we should think about it, I think, uh, because uh, till now you had these media companies and they had outlets and that was the way to look at things. We have, we have a big media company with, with a lot of outlets yeah. and you always thought you need, you need a company and you needed a company because you needed a printing press, you needed advertisements, you needed a lot of things and, 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 and to do them well you needed a company. But more and more, uh, we're less dependent, uh, dependent on, on advertisements. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, in the past, half of our income was coming from advertisement. Now it's only 20%. Um, you don't need an, a, a newspaper anymore. Yeah, that's, you're showing that. So perhaps you can, we can grow to some kind of other uh, finance base where the readers have the biggest uh, vote and the biggest share. I don't know, but no. and in such a system, it's 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 more logical to see a newspaper as an expression of a group of citizens, and then it's easier to cooperate. As long as you as you are in a company, you have all the competition law, and and then it's not that easy, I think. But yeah, but, but perhaps there Monica? is an easier collaborative possibility. Just spread the news regarding the situation. Yeah, and and show you you mentioned that. For Dutch people, it's not very well known, the situation. So if you doing the journalistic way, and you, as you wrote about it mm -hmm. in your paper, and, and other outlets are covering, spreading the news what's happening, then, then I think that might help. And uh, we had a very nice collaboration with the Finnish Helsinki Sanomat. What mm -hmm. they did, they just basically made a crowdfunding campaign for us. That right. Mm -hmm. show our story. Uh, I wrote, me and my co-editor-in-chief, Sabolj Du, we wrote an op-ed in their newspaper. They shot a small, small video documentary about our story. And uh, people from Finland, they just, they just started to contribute financially to our operation, basically just because they 
they heard about that. Because Sanomad wrote about it and, yes. yeah, and gave it yeah. attention. And it mm -hmm. has a large reach. So those kind of co collaboration, just journalists being journalists, are working yeah. according to my experience. Yeah. yeah. Have you been contacted by, um, for instance, uh, La Repubblica or, uh, or, or the Süddeutsche Zeitung or when you started uh, up? Is there something like a yeah, uh, of solidarity from other... Uh, Gazette Viborsa or whatever. Yeah, we uh, Gazette Viborsa, we they expressed the great solidarity towards us. Uh, we were on the front cover on the day of our uh, next day of our mass resignation with pictures and with the mm -hmm. whole story and and the, and the headline was in Hungarian mm -hmm. on the Polish newspaper. So we experienced quite a large solidarity yeah. among the journalistic community all around the world, basically. As I mentioned, Japanese public television came yeah. and into U.S., you know, it yeah. was... <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's a news fact. And I, uh, yes, um, that's the news fact, but uh, in the same time, they talk about the crowdfunding. Mm. So it's basically marketing as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, but, but from the point of view of... I mean, I could imagine that... It, for you, it would be hard to find somebody who writes a, a good piece on um, the German car industry outsourcing most of their production to Hungary and the relation it has to, you know, the uh, the, the economy of Hungary. Or, you know, would be difficult. But I would think that, you know, in Hungary, that would be a good um, uh, editor of, you know, of um, of Veronica who could write about it. You know, there's so an editorial cooperation. Yeah, or is that is that unthinkable? Yeah, we're open to to to, to everything, but but uh, every editorial staff have to have their own culture and their oh, own yeah. uh, right. yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> principles. So yeah. we try that there are more and more international corporations in journal journalism, and and I think it's very good. But but I don't I don't know if, if we have quite a few collaborative journalistic yeah. uh, uh, projects with I don't know with. All, from all around the world, from the US, from the EU countries. So it's, it's, it's possible, but it's, it's for content-based projects. It's not regarding uh, the business side of the project. We, no, exactly. we do yeah. journalism together because, because usually stories don't stop at the border. <laughs> Follow the money stories, go across the borders to Ukraine or to... to to Austria in, in, in our cases. So we have a lot of uh, uh, collaborative cross-border journalistic projects. But you were asking regarding the, the business side, yeah, as, well, I, as yeah. I understood. Uh, and uh, I, I don't really see how it's possible, as, as you mentioned, because every country has its own legal system. Every country has its own tax system. So. Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't really see, but I'm open to possibilities. If the journal, journalists are skeptical about it, but I saw you thinking, yes, there is a real possibility. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's no, you, funny to be on a table with, uh, with, academic, a, but with a journalist who no. talks like a diplomat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> normally, I'm, I'm the one who, who, uh, who uh, says uh, on the one hand, on the other a lot. Uh, I wanted to come back to two, uh, two points that you were making. Uh, first, to sort of portray, and you did that implicitly, that the rule of law issue in the European Union is somehow a West versus East uh, type of discussion. Well, there's, there's a lot of people who would... Yeah, yeah, I mean, but that's that. simply factually incorrect. Mm -hmm. uh, if you talk for, think, for example, about this regulation that links the rule of law uh, to cash, right? It is, is proposed by the European Commission, which has plenty of uh, Eastern European uh, commissions in, in it. It's approved by a large majority of the European Parliament, which has plenty of Eastern European members of European Parliament in it. And it has a, a qualified majority in the Council of, of Ministers, which has plenty of Eastern European member states in this. Yeah. So, uh, you know, talking about this in terms of East-West is buying into the frame of Judith Varga uh, and her, her friends. And we should really re reject this. This is a pan-European norm. There's another silver lining. Uh, because of all these problems in Poland and Hungary, the whole of the European Union is now left with much clearer norms about the rule of law and the freedom of the press that we could have imagined five years ago. Why? Mm -hmm. Because we now have five or six clear, crystal clear judgments about Poland, about what judicial independence means. 
and that applies to Portugal, to Malta, to Slovakia, to Hungary. We didn't have these things, and now the very highest court uh, in, um, in, in the European Union has clearly clarified that. Uh, Emily, in the beginning, uh, um, in her introductory talk, talked about uh, you know, uh, um, the government, uh, for strategic reasons, suing uh, newspapers, particularly in Poland. Slap cases, they're called. Strategic uh, way to silence your opponents. This has also trickled up to the European uh, Commission, and they're now proposing, uh, they're putting a lot of money into it first, and they're proposing regulation there. So we'll be ending up uh, with pan-European legislation that, that, that uh, deal with this problem, and that would have been uh, completely unimaginable uh, 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 without these problems in, in Poland and Hungary. And perhaps the last thing that I wanna uh, highlight there, and that's what you tried to start with and you didn't get a very clear answer uh, from uh, Veronica. It, it, it confronts us with uh, the question to ourselves, what would I do in that situation? If, if you had been in her shoes with two small kids, would you have the, had the same guts that Veronica did? If you were sitting in a chair uh, as a judge in Poland and, and, oh. and, and you're independent and impartial, um, but to put on a huge pressure, uh, it's, it's really inspiring to meet people who actually do, um, uh, you know, live by their principles. And mm -hmm. there are actually Eastern European uh, 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 fellow EU citizens. So we have a lot to learn, in fact, about the rule of law from them. It's not an East-West thing. And if it's an East-West thing, it's actually many people from the East, uh, East of the European Union that have a lot uh, to teach us. Yeah have a much better and clearer view of what it means to live by the rule of law and actually have um, and live the consequences of uh, um, uh, de um, um, of defending it yeah yeah that's that's an, that's an important thing to say um, um, I'm glad you also mentioned it's not a West European East European thing of course because you could also um, but there's a historical difference of course from the Second World War onwards of these societies, of course. So you could say, you know, there might be different um, uh, political feelings in it, but uh, you're absolutely right that uh, <laughs> that it's a, a pan-European um, uh, endeavor, of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was just wondering, uh, Peter Klok, if you're um, about this thing, you know, people living <laughs> like Veronica, living uh, actually the fact that you uh, think that. Uh, freedom of press or uh, or the constitution which guarantees it is a an important thing to live by could you and you're saying earlier and you're right absolutely you know it's difficult for us dutch to imagine that those things are slipping away huh? if yeah you, i think we need more european solidarity on on the citizen level we, yeah we are, we're always looking at, at at brussels at the european union but but that there's not really a, a feeling of so solidarity between the citizens you saw it in the Migration crisis, you see it in a lot. Of, there, there's always uh, south against north, east against west. But but I think we need to invest more in, in some common European feeling with some common values. And that's not only in Brussels or in Luxembourg, at, but also um, uh, under the citizens. And I think we don't have a lot of that European solidarity at the moment. And could you imagine... Um, Actually, are you... There are not many people, even, even on my editorial stuff, that's another form of uh, solidarity with, with Italy and the s south of Europe when they were in a financial crisis, or Greece. There's not a lot of solidarity. It's always they're taking our money or, or they are, yeah. uh, they're taking something else. Yeah. Uh, and Eastern Europeans are taking our jobs. Uh, and I think we, we really need to get some kind of European feeling and to invest in it. I don't know how, but, but I, I think and, and regarding it's the lost somewhere on the, along the way. And, and it regarding makes it very the, Dutch, difficult. The, the Dutch press, are you, could you imagine, you know, are, are you worried about the state of the Dutch press? Is there, is there any, should we be uh, warned by what's happening in Budapest? Or is there, is there anything where you think, well, actually, you know, listening to Veronica, it's, it's, it's far, it may be a, a far-fetched scenario, but could you imagine, you know, giving up your... Yeah, it, it, it's far-fetched, but, but, it, but in a way, uh, I think the lesson is that it can just happen to you. Mm -hmm. If you weaken your democracy, and I think we are weakening it at the moment, with, with uh, government, still no government, and, uh, and For lots instance? of people mm -hmm. losing mm -hmm. their trust in government, and, and uh, the public debate is also a little bit 
is not very healthy at the moment. I think a lot of polarization, mm -hmm. a lot of people having their own truth, not a lo lot of trust in society. Or I've, so, so that's all. Uh, um, it's not dangerous. We're still, I hope, far from where Hungary mm -hmm. is. But you should, you should always be careful, and prepare for the worst. Yeah. And. Uh, and really take care of democracy. It's something that you should cherish and, and, and work on. Yeah. And, and um, so I think that's an important lesson. Because in Holland we have, you know, we have the state, the state media, we have the NPO, of course, and then we have two big... That's uh, not state media. I think state media is something else, but... Well, okay, government, government paid. Yeah, government. Public, public uh, yeah. journalists. Pu public uh, journalists. I agree. It's, it's a better but it's word. Independent. But, um, it's independent. It's independent, it is. But... Um, um, but so we have, you know, um, uh, the NPO, and we have two big media companies who own all the newspapers. Is that is that enough, or is it worrying, or is that not a, at all? Yeah, uh, if you look at those situations. Yeah, as long as NRC and we are in different companies, it's that's not a problem. But yeah, I don't, I, I don't feel it as a problem because I, I don't have any problem with independence. Uh, I'm completely independent, and uh, the company I, I never hear uh, no. from the company only when once a year when we do the finance. So, so uh, I don't see a problem at the moment, but but yeah, it, it can become a problem yeah. when we have another owner. Yeah, uh, both of the companies are family owned, mm -hmm. and that's uh, I, I think that's a guarantee against uh, uh, yeah that just a political party can. can can infiltrate it. Can infiltrate. Yeah. So, so mm -hmm. it's it, it's healthy, but but it's it's also vulnerable, of yeah. course. Yeah, yeah. If, if, uh, if a Rupert Murdoch comes with a lot of money, yeah, for instance, and, uh, or the friends of Orban, and, and there's a, uh, a new family member who who doesn't like the media company and thinks we're going to cash. Yeah, it can happen. Yeah. So it's always better to to have more media companies. I think. Yeah. Yeah, I've been a journalist in 2006, as I show where, when the freedom of press, the situation of freedom of press in Hungary was amazing, as I, I shown the data for you in my speech. So from, I, from the position of 12, what was it, to 90, 92 or something? Yeah, 10th. 10th to, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I have been worked as a reporter back then, and we could not foresee that. I mean, it was not like this, but... Uh, but a slow and long process, uh, but we could not imagine anything like that before, that I, that I call and ask any ministry as a press official and, and I never got an answer. Mm -hmm. I could never <laughs> expect anything like that happening. That is, that's an important notion, because indeed from yes. the, the position of number 10, we are number eight or number five or something in the world. And, and then, you know, it's, but it's not forever. No, obviously, m maybe not. No, no, obviously not. No, no, no. That's why I said that By it's definition, a depressing no. manner. No. No, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> History is long. Only yeah. there for yeah. 100 years, <laughs> democracy. Yeah. So. Yeah, uh, yeah I, th I think this is a very strong story. It yeah. can happen to us also. Why not? Yeah. Okay, on this, on this, on this optimistic note, <laughs> <laughs> in the sense that you're absolutely right, we have a lot to learn from uh, people around Europe who, uh, uh, have to, who can teach us that it's, you know, it's vulnerable and we have to, uh, as you call it, have some love, care and tender. There's only one, uh, one country in the world, I think, at the moment that's not be becoming more autocratic. Yeah, the index on... Uh, yeah. Suriname. I think Suriname is the only Went country that's, that's going the right direction, but <laughs> in the whole world you see countries moving. Yeah. In that direction, H Hungary is moving. Yeah, I autocratic. Think. We're living in an autocratic moment. Yeah. yeah. So maybe why why shouldn't we? And we, maybe we haven't seen the end of it. Um, on this note, um, which I try to frame as an optimistic note, that there is you know inspiration <laughs> to be found uh, in places like Budapest. Um, uh, and we thank you. I'd like to thank you three very very much, and especially Veronica Munk for uh, being here and talking. Uh, amongst each other and amongst us and in, here in the audience and going to the audience actually to see whether there's anybody who like to participate or say something or have as a, a remark. I see somebody um, with the glasses next to the... Um, um, yeah, it's you. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's nobody in, in the Great. back. Uh, 
And remember, yes. a, a, a question is a question is a phrase with a question mark at the end. You know, Absolutely. Long. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm Pepin Garrett. I'm from the Netherlands Helsinki Committee. Um, Veronica, thanks for your, your speech. Uh, very inspiring. I was wondering, you, you said now you have 625,000 readers average per day. Uh, is, is that base mainly Budapest or, or is it really spread around the country? Uh, and the, the reason I'm asking is also the upcoming elections and how will those people outside of the bigger cities be informed? Yeah, question that's an mark. important question. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, our readers, according to our survey, uh, 60 or 70 percent of our readers is, is coming from the capital. The other one third is coming from larger cities outside of Budapest and from abroad, expats living outside uh, the country and would like to have fact-based information regarding their, their home country. Uh, but yeah, that's an important, uh, important factor for us actually to, 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 to reach more people outside the capital. So that's why we have, uh, we started uh, to locate local regional correspondence uh, says to larger uh, cities outside Budapest because, because basically uh, freedom of press is non-existence outside uh, of the capital and, uh, and, uh, and as I mentioned, county newspapers, all of them belong to Keshma, to this large foundation. So people who do not consume their news uh, online, if they only consume their news on a print newspaper, that they only have one choice, the pro-governmental media. So elderly people or people who, who doesn't have internet connection and so on. It's, it is a problem. We do not have a print version, but we can, we can expand our audience uh, with these local correspondents and with roadshows around larger cities. Uh, so that's what we do uh, to make Telex uh, most known outside the capital. Thank you. And there's a gentleman um, with the glasses uh, in his <laughs> polo shirt. Hello, Naipo uh, from Woerden. Um, do, you, do you have sympathy for the people who voted for the president of Hungary? Um, well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, two thirds of the voters vote for the government in Hungary, so it's the vast majority of the country. I, I mean, I, as I would not express my emotions. I mean, uh, I don't think that an, an impartial journalist would, would make opinion regarding what's the choice of the voters. Yes. Why they vote? Why, why Hungarians yes. vote? Yes. Or, well, <laughs> uh, uh, it is not a, a shortly uh, explainable um, uh, situation. Uh, according to the polls, uh, I mean, populist governance works not just in Hungary, but in other countries uh, in the world. Even in the US, it works for for the previous administration, uh, and uh, and and power and spending money uh, uh, on um, on uh, fragile uh, population parts of the population, it can affect uh, uh, that people would like to. Uh, would like to know that that there is a. Str I mean, it's all about the narrative. It's all the narrative is regarding power. It's regarding showing and expressing strengths, and 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 that's what uh, it seems that that's what the voters needs.
No, no, no. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's 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 an interesting conversation. I agree. <laughs> but but um, um, and there's a gentleman over here uh, who'd like to come in. I'm on the ambassador of Hungary in the Netherlands. Uh, first of all, it's uh, it's always a delight to uh, to listen to uh, poems of uh, Vörös Marti and uh, and Radnóti, especially the one from. Uh, from Vörös Marti, uh, Press Freedom, I guess. It was, uh, it was about... The 1848 uh, poem. 47, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. 48, yes. Uh, you know, about uh, prisoners. Uh, uh, rise from your chains. And I think it's, it's a very important topic nowadays as well. And uh, after uh, uh, more than four decades of communist dictatorship, I can tell you that we Hungarians do appreciate and do cherish that now we live in freedom, that now we live in democracy, <laughs> and, uh, and we can elect our leaders, and that uh, rule of law, the fundamental freedoms, human rights are all constitutionally safeguarded. Now, uh, just to give you a different perspective on the, on the current Hungarian media landscape, a decade ago, the uh, media landscape in Hungary looked like, uh, looked like this. 90% left-wing liberal media, 10% right-wing conservative media. Just like the Netherlands nowadays, I mean, you have DPG and Media House. Uh, what happened in the past decade is uh, the media landscape started to inch towards uh, a more balanced situation. But, uh, but we are not quite there yet. Let me give you some examples that, you, that I have never read in the Volkskrant on NRC. The most popular TV station in Hungary is critical of the government. The most popular daily newspaper is critical of the government. The most popular weekly is critical of the government. And the most uh, popular news site on the internet, well, is also critical of the government. So, uh, so this is how it looks like uh, in Hungary now. In, and if I can have one comment on the current situation in the Netherlands as well, a short one. You're very welcome to comment on now, sure. A journalist yeah, has no. recently be, been killed in this country. Molotov cocktails have been thrown into the house of a journalist. Three years ago, a minivan drove into the uh, building of the biggest daily newspaper. Mm -hmm. Now, the Telegraph. Yeah. The Telegraph. If this would have happened in Hungary, I'm, I'm sure everybody would, would have been uh, all hysterical. But this not happened in Hungary. This happened in the Netherlands. So uh, I, uh, I think you might want to uh, exercise some self-reflection be before you start worrying about others. In interesting remarks. Um, uh, um, maybe, uh, maybe uh, the false count. <laughs> Peter Klok. I think in your mind there are no independent media. You you look at uh, only political. Um, I think uh, newspapers can be very independent. And uh, so not right wing or left wing. You mean not right wing or left wing. Okay. Not everything mm -hmm. is political. A journalist mm -hmm. is interested. In it needs to be objective, uh, and I think a government should take care that 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 journalists can be objective. And and uh, it was not the government that killed uh, the journalist you mentioned, so it's quite strange to mention it in this. It's it's a, it's organized crime, you mean? Uh, yeah, yeah, probably is. Mm -hmm. Uh, but but the most important thing is in the Netherlands we we try to uh, we try to make just newspapers. And, and just bring facts, and the government doesn't involve, and that, that's the way to do it. So, so uh, put up your political glasses, I should say, and just look at newspaper as bringers of objective news. Mm -hmm. That's uh, what we do. I'd also like to thank you for your comments, Ambassador. Uh, and I also would like to highlight that uh, not everything about politics and journalists are not political actors. So we shouldn't put it in the political narrative if, uh, if journalists would just 
would like to share information to people so people can decide to make free decisions in their lives. Basically, that's the function of, of journalism, that's the function of media in every democracy. So uh, I always refuse, so that's what I do now again, uh, when, uh, when somebody, anybody, try to put us in this political narrative and, uh, and try to, try to situate, situate uh, personally us as journalists or our news outlet in the political uh, uh, field, lefties or, or right wings or oppositional ones or, or pro-governmental ones, I don't uh, like, I, I, I'd like to refuse it and I'd like to say that their, their only, only purpose is to, to give fact-based information to people. Uh, and and we do not have any political um, political um, approaches to our readers. I saw you making uh, some comments on your yeah. I, I was also because I you was, want to add something or I, I was furiously making a note. Now. Uh, I don't think that we disagree uh, about uh, and that the rule of law is a pan-European standard that uh, would have to be equally applied uh, to the Netherlands. Uh, and and we, we should be self-critical. And many of the instruments in the European Union setting are actually uh, made to have a dialogue uh, between uh, different member states. Mm -hmm. uh, the Commission uh, writes a report about the rule of law every year, which has a chapter on, on, on freedom of the media, for example. Uh, but, uh, you know, the European Commission's chapter on Hungary is about four times as long as the, European, the, the chapter on, on the Netherlands. That's just a, the objective fact. Uh, and, and there's many infringement actions that the European Commission uh, starts against Hungary and not uh, against the Netherlands in, in this case. Um, so I, I, I have no uh, qualm with uh, if, if the claim is that we should be self-critical. I think that's absolutely correct. And, Everybody should uh, apply the same standards. And all I'm arguing for is that these standards that are crystal clear are actually applied to the, the, the member states that have the biggest problem. Uh, and, and the biggest problem, uh, for example, with regard to linking the rule of law to, to cash is that in Hungary, uh, corruption with EU cash is about 10 times as high uh, as the, the runner-up. And that's the reason why there's an incentive uh, for, uh, and, and a legal possibility uh, to act specifically against uh, Hungary. Uh, and um, uh, so, so that's, uh, I, I don't think that was a contradiction between uh, being self-critical to, to, uh, and, and, and acting where's the biggest problem. Okay, thank you for your comments on the comment of the, um, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you for your comment as well, Mr. Ambassador. Um, I see one more hand with the OC, I see two hands. First we go to the lady over here because you're the first lady to raise your hand and um, we've only heard men. I, yes, a <laughs> um, little bit away from this subject, but I was uh, curious about Peter, what you were saying about creating this European solidarity. How can we do that in the West? That is my question. And a little story with it as well. I'm partly Hungarian. Um, and this summer I was in Hungary and there was this uh, enquête, uh, I don't know how you say it in English. Inquiry uh, survey, or yeah. survey, yeah. Uh, going across the country, and uh, I quote, there was a question, this was one of the questions. After the epidemic, Brussels will again abuse their power and start proceedings against their country to force their will on the Hungarians. What do you think? Hungary must defend its interests in every debate, or we must allow Brussels to abuse Hungary. And I was, oh sorry, I was wondering why was this not in the Dutch newspapers, because I was very surprised, I was surprised, this is Europe, and is this Europe, and how can we create European solidarity if we don't hear these very, yeah, personal stories, and we are from a very small village in the countryside, and that's why I really liked your question as well. If you come there and hear their stories, you really understand why people vote for Orban, for Fidesz, because this is their entry to, yeah, the politics, and yeah, how, what can we do in the West to help this? Solidarity to yeah further uh, form. Maybe maybe it was directed to you, Peter Glock, but maybe you have an idea about no. the European so solidarity. Yeah, raise awareness. I think uh, 
it's the only thing we can do and and uh um, yeah, try to, to, to tell as many stories of Europeans that that, that, that that you create empathy, empathy for each other. I think that's the way, uh, and that's what we can do as, as a newspaper. Uh, yeah, I don't, is, is, is that enough? Or already? Uh, leading question. Uh, the Volkskrant, of course. <laughs> Yeah, we, we try to have as many correspondents as possible, so, so the, the, that's one way to do it, uh, and I think that's very important, and NSA has also a lot of correspondents, uh, but, but not every medium has, has it, and I think we, sh we should invest in that, and uh, yeah, cr uh, I don't know, create as much empathy as we can. Do you have any ideas Europeans. as a team? Yeah, you, you can donate. <laughs> I mean, you can always spend our money. So, I mean, we are the only newspaper in, uh, in Hungary now who, have, who, who has a correspondent in Kabul reporting about the Afghani situation because we spend your donations to the... It, just out of curiosity, is that, a, is that an Afghan correspondent or an Hungarian? Oh, it's a Hungi my Hungarian colleague who was traveling to, to Kabul. That's a dangerous thing to do. It is, but that's the job. That's not <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I was thinking, um, why wasn't it in the Dutch newspaper? It's a good question. Uh, you were there, you wrote it down, you can write, write an opinion article about it. Yeah. So it's probably not in the Dutch newspaper because there are not that many people who speak Hungarian and would be able to write it in Dutch. Yeah. So I was thinking, wow, if you have that quotation, you know, that would be an interesting opinion article probably in the Volkskrant or... You know. That's but a real problem. <laughs> Our correspondent doesn't speak Hungarian. So there's a language problem too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, that was referring earlier to the to the cooperation thing. You know, that, that is a problem, of course. And, and, and you're probably one of the, you know, a, a few thousand people who both read Hungarian and, 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 and mm -hmm. write Dutch. Anyway, sorry, that was just, <laughs> but um, and there was, a, I think, a last question of the gentleman over there with the brown. Um. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jan Meyer. I uh, research uh, populist Euro skepticism uh, in Poland uh, for university in, uh, in Krakow. Um, and I wanted to ask your opinion about a specific uh, case related to the independence of the media. Um, earlier this summer, Victor, uh, the Hungarian go uh, government published, tried to publish an advertisement in uh, a series of European newspapers. And it caused a bit of a discussion on whether such advertisements should be placed in, in media or not. Uh, some magazines and newspapers refused to publish this advertisement because it was a very explicit uh, political statement by the Hungarian government signed by Viktor Orban. Um, other newspapers uh, did not decide to, did not have an explicit opinion about it. And some newspapers and magazines did publish this advertisement. Um, it was quite controversial. And as far as I know, uh, the Volkskrant and NSA did not have an explicit refusal of this advertisement, but also did not publish it. So my question would be specifically to, uh, to, to Ms. Munk and, uh, and Mr. Klok. What your opinion is about this type of question? Uh, is it a sign of independence of the editorial board and the advertisement part of, the, of a newspaper? If something like this can be published? Or is this a line that is crossed if an explicit government piece of communication, if not propaganda, maybe communication, uh, is published in media all over Europe? Interesting case, but... Uh, actually, at Telex, we have this policy that we do not publish any political advertisement. We do not care if which side is coming from. We do not publish them. It would be a great money, though, but we decided not to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the choice of it's it's uh, it's the matter of, of money and it's the matter of of the values of every every outlet, I guess. Peter, yeah, at our newspaper we publish everything, advertisements yeah. from everybody. Only yeah. only when it's uh, criminal. So. Uh, I think we should publish. Uh, you would. We would. You would not published. object as as an edi editor to, to the. You would not object to the owner. No. No. In this case, no. 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 Uh, 
but that's our policy. I'm just wondering, very curious, because you put an interesting question, and it's your research topic, if I'm right. And what's your opinion on it? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. Well, um, I can hide behind the fact that I study Poland and not Hungary, but... Uh, yeah, you I just pointed that out. So. Yeah, no, no, I, I think it goes very far if, if a government can buy space in, in a newspaper or in, in media that proclaims themselves to be independent, because the reputation of this media is um, based on their own journalism, mm -hmm. and everybody knows that an advertisement is not a piece of journalism. Um, but if we allow political messages to be bought into between, sorry, between uh, pieces of independent uh, journalism, I think it harms harms the the rest of the newspaper and harms the reputation of, of free press mm -hmm. and it's an it's an disbalance of of information flow so if you ask my opinion yeah, that I, be it. <laughs> yeah but I, I think Fico Orban has the right to defend himself yeah uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it's an interesting point. It's uh, very interesting. On the, on the, um, we're organizing a journalistic cafe. Uh, we're starting it, so this would be an interesting uh, topic. Um, I'm just wondering that, that because in that case you would say, well, maybe Shell shouldn't advertise. You know, between the uh, you know, what's the difference between a big company and a big and a state organization, and ha do they have the rights and the other hasn't? And but I'm not saying that I know the answer to it. But it's an interesting. <laughs> um, have you any legal point of view on this? No, not really. Uh, no. I think it's really a, a, a decision on uh, of, of journalistic freedom. So uh, it depends really on the policy of uh, of, of, of the, any newspaper. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and both are respectable. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I'm um, not allowing any more questions. I thought there were a few more hands, but it's about time to. Um, uh, we're way over time. Um, uh, uh, thank you very much for attending. It's wonderful that we have a sold-out hall. You know, wonderful that we um, we are not uh, Zandvoort and millionaires yet, but you know, it's getting there. <laughs> and um, uh, um, and thank you all four very very much for your participation and uh, being here. And we hope to see you again. Uh, uh, um, at the next Freedom Lecture of any other uh, 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 Bali programs. So thank you very much. Um, there's still beer in the hole. <laughs>